All right, Ken, why don't you start us off with a prayer? Thank you for praying. I, I really appreciate praying before we do anything. Father, we worship you and love you, Father. We love Jesus. We love the Holy Spirit. Lord, before your throne today and the entourage and, and the living creatures and the 24 elders and everybody that's there and hearing our prayer today, Lord, it, it, before your presence, we ask that your mighty hand would would reach down and touch us today in such a way that we can glorify you with a great program that would reach millions of people and make a difference today, Lord, we pray, in people's hearts and minds. So we are thankful for the opportunity to serve you today. We pray that uh, your kingdom will come, your will be done on this earth as it is in the heavens, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I would like to also encourage anybody who's listening to pick up the Bible, give it a try, and focus on Matthew chapter 6 and seek first the kingdom of heaven. If you're not happy, if you're living what you consider a miserable life, well, you can be much better off if you follow Christ. It doesn't mean, just because you're a Christian, being a Christian is a hard thing to do, Ken. Uh, it doesn't mean that everything is going to be easy and everything is going to go your way. It doesn't mean that you're not going to sin anymore. You're going to always face all kinds of challenges, but you'll be far better off if you seek first the kingdom of God. Don't be double-minded. That's another thing. If you, if you want if you want to set yourself up to failure, be double-minded. Be sure what you do and pray that you do God's will. That's my advice for today. And the thing about advice, it's free. Right, Ken? <laughs> well, the thing of it is, is that everybody's double-minded. Uh, the Scripture is written for everybody, where all the people that look in the mirror go away and forget who we are. I mean, this is for everybody. This is the condition we find ourselves in on this planet as human beings. This is the, this is the reason Christ came out of the heavens to the earth, to begin to not only initially redeem us, but also to perfect us. And the perfecting comes through the suffering. Suffering's part of the deal. Uh, that way we might know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Wow, that, that, that is in Philippians, powerful words, and it helps identify uh, our conditions so that we know that through the Lord we can, we can get the victory over our flesh in this world. But it's a daily walk. It's, it's not something you put on the shelf after you accept Jesus. It's daily, and it is a narrow way. It, is, it isn't easy, and that's what people think it is. Once you accept Jesus, oh, it would be real easy straight. No, 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 no. It's a conflict. It's a fight. It's a fight of our faith. So you're right. You're right. It's not easy being a believer. And here's a, a quick prayer that you can always say over and over again to yourself, because it it immediately puts you in the presence of Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the sinner's prayer. We we call it in the Orthodox Church. It's what Bartimaeus said while Jesus is on his way from Jericho going up to Jerusalem for his passion, death, and resurrection. Uh, Bartimaeus is sitting there. He's going, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. He keeps saying that. Have mercy on me. And that uh, phrase, have mercy on me, also can be love me, love me love me. So uh, it's something to contemplate. Remember Bartimaeus. Remember how he screamed out for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you got to you gotta be saved. You have to be born again from above, like Jesus talks to Nicodemus about this. You could be a priest. You could be a preacher. You could be whomever you are, president or a pauper. If you're not saved, you're not going to, uh, you're not going to get an eternal life. And it's a leap of faith. And you got to be all in. Uh, one of the things that I find a little bit troubling, Ken, is people who find Christ, who uh, believe in Christ, they don't make any of the necessary changes. This repent is a cha- repenting is a change of life. You can't go around going, I'm covered in the blood of Jesus and think that's it. <laughs> you can just do whatever you want. Oh, that's not it. You have to live your life by the gospel. And any other gospel that is preached uh, to you, let him be accursed than the one that you've received. We're going to talk about uh, the unforgettable tree and some of the different parts about this. Uh, We haven't talked about false flags all that much, and it's one of those topics that people get confused with, Ken. False flag doesn't mean it didn't happen. It means that who's ever behind it uh, is, is the rest of the story. 
That's uh, not to be confused with a hoax. A hoax is something that didn't happen. It's not true. False flag means that not everything is as it seems. In regard to false flags, in the book, The Unforgettable Tree, what are you talking about? Well, uh, if I may, I'd like to uh, explain something about what you're saying in terms of the legitimacy of the life of Christ being lived out, uh, as opposed to the motions of the flesh and the things that we do that are uh, a, co- a contradiction to, to that life. And, and the life that the Lord offers is a life of, of transmission from His throne to our spirit, our heart. Our heart is our spirit. That's who we really are, uh, that our spiritual self. And the spiritual self is to be so filled with the life of the spirit that it flows into our soul, our psyche. Uh, so the life of, of Jesus is apprehended by our hearts being lifted up to him so that in that capacity, it's kind of like a plug being plugged into the wall. We, we receive his power, and the power is not an emotional thing. It's the power of, of that, that is able to hold us and keep us, and not only that, to expand our inner person. And, and as we're plugged in, to God through our faith, uh, we we receive the the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Ghost. They're the, they're not the same. The Holy Spirit is like a river that flows, and the Holy Ghost is is the 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 shadow, the white shadow of the Spirit in our spirit. So we we are overshadowed by God through the Holy Spirit, which Holy Ghosts us, and that Holy Ghosting is the growth that God is uh, extending to us so that we are perfected in our spirit. We're told in the book of Hebrews that we've been called to this mountain, not a mountain of law called Mount Mount, uh, uh, Horeb, where the law was given, but we've we've been called to Mount Zion for the perfecting of our spirits. That's what it says there. We've been called to this holy mountain. And as we learn how to walk on that mountain, we become the citizens of Zion. I'm, I'm a citizen of Zion, and I'm being perfected. So w- when we're saved, that's just the first step. Now I'd like to share with you something that I think will help everybody uh, in, in this walk that we're called to. When I was, uh, I used to play uh, college ball, and then I got the opportunity to play pro football with the San Francisco 49ers and the, and the uh, uh, Houston Oilers. About three months before I went to my second opportunity at the pros, I, was, I used to be a gambler and a womanizer, and I was like uh, this wild guy, you know, and, and I used to go to Las Vegas a lot because I loved to gamble. I used to love to gamble, and I, well, on one occasion, I flew to Las Vegas to meet my Uncle Leo, who flew in from Detroit, and we met there, and uh, we went out. He ditched his wife so he could go out playing craps with me. <laughs> I, listen, I'm a sinner saved by grace, just like everybody else. Uh, so we're we're playing uh, craps, and and uh, and and, the, and my uncle Leo has had a few drinks, and he's going crazy. And I was laughing so hard I could hardly stand up. And and he was he was he was, went wild because we were, we were winning so big. I mean, it was like going crazy. I mean, there, there was a crowd of 50 people. He created that, uh, you know, this amazing, uh, um, situation where people were trying to figure out what's going on here. We were just winning, winning, winning. We were good to lose. And so these people that were standing next to me, uh, whose name I got to know is, uh, Louis and Doris Lavage, were kind of laughing along with the whole crowd of people, just raucous. It was just, it was really something. Uh, anyway, uh, they, I noticed that they had this accent, and I said, well, where are y'all from? They said, well, we're from Houston, Texas. And it turned out they're Jewish people like myself. And I said, well, I'm, I just signed a contract with the Houston Oilers. I'll be in Houston shortly. And they said, well, let us be your family. Uh, your surrogate family when you come to Houston. And they gave me their phone number and address. Now, Doris was about 50. She had this all platinum blonde hair, and Louie was, you know, 55, 60 years old. And here I am, 22. And so uh, I forgot about them and went home. And uh, I so before I left for, the, for Houston, 
I, I went to my girlfriend's mother's house to say goodbye to her because I was going off to play ball. They lived in Southern California, and they, they were military people. And in the morning when I woke up in the guest room, uh, I, I was in a dream state. And I was in this dream state. And in this dream state, uh, I see this woman looking down at me. And she says, uh, I, I look at her and she had this stern look on her face. And, and, and I said, where am I? And they, she said, well, you've been in the hospital for 10 days. And, I, and, and the, the dream faded away, and, and I forgot about it. Uh, th- three months later, I wake up in the hospital, and here's this woman that I saw in the dream three months prior looking down at me, and it was Doris Lavage. And this is now I'm seeing her in the in the real, not in a dream state. Now she's looking down at me, and and, and this is the woman I met at Vegas at the dice table. And it turns out I'm in the hospital nine or ten days. And what had happened was my arm got ripped out of the socket in a game against the New Orleans Saints, oh. and they had to do so uh, shoulder surgery on me. And and it was the end of my football career. It was a godsend. It was a godsend to keep me from being successful because I was pretty good. And, and that was the end of my career. Uh-huh. And that dream, that dream uh, changed the whole course of my life because I went, how could this possibly happen? How could I see something like this way off in the future? And then it actually happened. Yikes. And I realized, I realized there was something I didn't know about existence that had to do with a spiritual dimension. I didn't know how to contact it. I was a Jewish guy. I didn't know anything about the Old Testament or the New Testament or about Jesus or anything. Except when I grew up, I had kind of a reverence for his name. And God, without, uh, you know, he intervened, supernaturally intervened in my life, not because I did anything good, but because I'm, I'm one of the called of God. I'm called of God. And I didn't know that. In fact, he called me from before I was even born into this world. And there's people out there that are called of God, that God wants to connect with and give these kinds of things uh, supernaturally uh, to happen on a regular basis. And so since I wrote that book, The Deep State, uh, excuse me, uh, I've written uh, several books, but this book, The Unforgettable Tree, uh, that book is so important uh, to people uh, developing a more clear channel to the throne of God so that they can have uh, supernatural experiences. Remember, Jesus said to Nathaniel, one of the first people he called, uh, he saw him under a fig tree. And that really is important symbolism in the Scriptures, because Adam and Eve, that's the tree they ate from that caused the downfall of the human race. But Jesus is saying to Nathaniel, when Nathaniel says, well, you're the Son of God, you're the Messiah, he said, because I saw you under the fig tree, you're going to see greater things than these. You're going to see angels ascending and descending on Ben Adam, the son of man. Now, there's people in the Old Testament called Ben Adam. Ezekiel is one of them. Now, there's others. It's a term that's generic to all humans. We're all Ben Adams. We're all sons of Adam. And the promise to uh, Nathaniel was that, that you're going to have experiences with angels. They're going to come and give you information and knowledge and revelation. Uh, so that your life isn't just about doctrines and theories and dogmas. You're going to have experiential realities that are going to be things that help you live your life in this world. That's what God's people need. They they, they don't need any more dogma or, or the Apostles' Creed. What they need is a reality of the resurrection of Jesus, that I might know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death. Now, that last statement there, being conformed to his death, was renewed to me several nights ago when I was had a visitation from the angels. They woke me in the middle of the night and came to me and said, you have to go back and remember that the power of the resurrection is, is, is magnified and accelerated by understanding the death of Jesus. That's why we have communion, but it's also why we have water baptism. Water baptism is so important. It's a gateway. It's a gateway that sets us up for greater experiences from the throne of God. And and so the the angels started talking to me about water baptism again, which I hadn't thought about for years. Because when you're water baptized, if you're trained properly, and if you're educated into the real meaning of water baptism, then you understand that when you submit to this calling, repent and be baptized, and thou shalt be saved, 
uh, you begin to understand that God requires a death. He requires a total death. And, and so water baptism is God's sacrament that helps us uh, commit to something that's very tangible and manifested in, on the earth, because the waters of baptism are the waters of death. And when we're lowered into the waters, we're, uh, uh, we're uh, uh, acknowledging uh, the death of Jesus on the tree. Many people say it's a cross, but in, 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 a, in essence, he was killed on a tree. And that's an incredible revelation. But when we acknowledge his death, whether we see it as a tree or a cross, uh, and I don't have problems with crosses, I'm just saying that the reality of Jesus' death and how was on a tree. It was on the fig tree that he cursed, actually. But anyway, that's all in that book. Uh, And we surrender to water baptism. We're saying we recognize that Jesus died he had to die to rescue the human race. And likewise, we have to acknowledge and identify with his death through water baptism. We go into the waters of death. We're saying, okay, that's it for me. I'm dying to this life. I'm dying to this world. Mm-hmm. And that's why Paul said in Galatians, I'm crucified with Christ. I mean, in other words, I'm identifying with the death. death. Nevertheless, I live. We live because when we come out of the water, we're still alive, but the Holy Spirit meets us there. He meets us when we come out of the water, and and we begin to get the first inclination or touching of the Holy Spirit. There's more to it than that, but that's the first step. And if people don't take that water baptism seriously and understand that they're identifying with the death of Jesus on the on the cross or the tree, then they're not going to have much of an experience with God. They're going to have a very um, uh, uh, undynamic life with, with the Lord. And, and God's saying, look, you've got to understand that this is a narrow way, that, that you have to die. You have to die to yourself, and you have to die to this world if you want a, the real power of my resurrection. And that resurrection is is an awesome thing. I've been saved now for over 50 years, and I'm just as uh, I'm more powerful in Jesus than ever because of the, the, the Holy Spirit that's come to me that has now overshadowed me with the, with the Holy Ghosting in my inner person. So I'm a developed brother, and God wants to develop all of his children in like capacity. And, and so we have to know how to use our faith and go before the throne of God like we prayed at the beginning and appropriate the life of the Spirit through faith. And it's not creed. There's a difference between creed and faith. You can have all the creeds, but not use your faith. It's a, it's a big difference. I agree with that. We're with uh, Ken um, Klein. He's got KenKleinProductions.net. How about that? I remembered it's a .net, Ken. Uh, <laughs> what do you got going on on the site right now? Um, well, I, you know, I have all my films, and I have a new film uh, called The Deep State Prophecy and the Last Trump. We could talk about that, probably not today, but that's the new thing coming out. Uh, we have one little musical copyright issue that we're cleaning up. Actually, it was a weekend. But that particular uh, film deeps, deals with uh, what what's really happening underneath all of this chaos that we're seeing in the political world, mm. where it's come from. Because the deep state isn't just uh, the beltway in which Washington, D.C. is surrounded by. It goes way back in time, and it gives you this panoramic perspective on how uh, this world and and its trending has been going on for many centuries and where it's going to go. So it's not only historic, it's prophetic. And and people need to get this uh, panoramic viewpoint of, of, of human time and what's happened over the millennium all the way back to the Egyptian Empire, all the way to present tense, and what's going to go on in the future. So it's it's this uh, objective worldview that helps us understand the danger we're in here in the United States and what the world's uh, experiencing globally uh, with with the deep state. It's not just the United States, it's everywhere. Now, I just heard in California, just just to give you an idea, the last uh, yesterday, they passed a law uh, where you're not allowed to speak in churches against a uh, gay lesbian uh, agenda. You, it's against the law now in California, in the churches, to use any scripture to speak about this atrocity of confusion, sexual confusion, 
in in the world and specifically now in California. Because, you know, as California goes, so goes the United States. And then just today at Duke University, they outlawed a young life uh, from the campus of Duke University. They're not called the Blue Devils <laughs> by accident. So we're watching this net. Uh, coming over the whole world, we're seeing it uh, in California now across the country. It's happening everywhere, and if people don't have this objective understanding, they're going to fall for it. And uh, I'm afraid that, we're, that many people are going to be destroyed by this new world order that's being manifested now uh, through through the United Nations, which is a, a per, totally prophetic. And so that's what that film's about. And 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 again, it'll be out shortly. But it's really more important, honestly. Uh, uh, the tree book that I wrote, uh, uh, this unforgettable tree for your personal faith. Objectivity is great, but you've got to learn how to use faith and go before the throne of God. And I'm working on a whole other piece that I want to film in Israel uh, at at uh, at the uh, foot of Mount Hermon in northern Israel, where Jesus uh, took his disciples and uh, they he said to them, you know, what do people say? Uh, who the Son of Man is. And the, some say Jeremiah, some say Elias, Elias or Elijah, uh, or some say John the Baptist. And then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, he did that right at uh, uh, Caesarea Philippi, which was known as the Gate of Hell, uh, because they had all these foreign religions there. And it, it, was, a, it was a place where Jews were forbidden to go because it was so spiritually dangerous. And Jesus marches his disciples there and says, well, these gates of hell won't prevail against my church. And then he proceeds six days later to take them to the Mount of Transfiguration, which which is what Mount Hermon is. And that's another story that we'll get into down the road. But incredible stuff uh, that's coming for us. I plan to go to Israel uh, probably in February to film that one. So that's what's on the agenda for me. But the the latest thing coming out just in days is this deep state prophecy and the last Trump. Just amazing, amazing film. I'm looking forward to uh, your forthcoming films. That sounds really interesting to me that Jesus is asking his apostles, who do you say I am? And then Peter confesses. Soon after Peter makes that confession, Jesus talks about his death, uh, his passion, death and resurrection. And Peter wants to put a stop to that. Uh, That's right. And he says, get yeah. behind me, Satan. So he's in the, the, the gates of hell where Peter he tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. And as far as the, the linguistics of that, and I've, upon this rock I will build my church, in your opinion, what is Jesus talking about? What is the rock? Is it Peter, as the, um, the Romans claim, or is it something different? Well, I think it's interesting that the minute he says that the, the reasonings of hell won't prevail— uh, Peter is bringing forth the reasoning of hell. <laughs> so it, immediately Jesus is demonstrating that that kind of reasoning that you're bringing forth, like, oh my, and you think Peter was, oh Lord, we don't want you to die. You know, we, 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 that can't happen to you. And Jesus is saying, get behind me, Satan. I have to die or there was no res- rescue of the human race. So uh, Peter is using this humanitarian attitude to confront Jesus and Jesus rebukes his humanitarianism, and that's one thing we're seeing in the world today. It's almost as though liberalism is this humanitarianism that is akin to Peter saying to Jesus, no, that's not supposed to happen for you. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing uh, uh, application to what's going on here, and Jesus rebukes him and says, get thee behind me, Satan. But he says, "Thou, your name is going to be, because you saw that by your testimony, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, he says, therefore, your name is Stone, and on this, which is Petros, but on this Pietra, I will build my church. Well, what, what do you mean, Petra? Well, the rock of ages is Jesus. It's it, it's not Peter. <laughs> Peter is just somebody that made the right confession, but two seconds later, he makes a wrong confession. So this isn't the this isn't the church isn't to be built on Peter. It's to be built on Jesus. Uh, he, he, there's only one mediator between God and man, and it's not saints and it's not Peter. Uh, Peter was a, a massive, uh, a failure. I mean, look what Peter, here's a guy, here's a guy that, uh, uh, saw the feeding of the 5,000, the 7,000. He saw the healing of Bartimaeus and many healings. He saw, uh, um, amazing things. He saw Jesus walking on water. He, in fact, he got out of the boat and he walked on water. 
uh, uh, Peter was there at the Mount of Transfiguration when he saw the kingdom of, of God coming, which Jesus said, you know, there at uh, Caesarea Philippa, there's some standing here that are going to see the kingdom come. And he was one of, one of the three, Peter, James, and John, climbed that Mount Hermon. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to climb that mountain with my wife. Oh, that's wife. awesome. And, and I, you know, after hey, the— Hey, tra- Zach, yeah. hey, Zach. Why don't you go with me and climb Mount Hermon with me and my wife? That would be your, awesome. Would bring, you like to go? Bring Sophie and Emily? Yeah, that'd be awesome. We'll have to, we we'll have to we, think about that. We'll have to plan that one out. Absolutely, but I'd love for you to go. That'd be cool. Anyway, uh, Peter is there at the house. Uh, he's there when Jesus is at the Garden of Gethsemane, and he, and he speaks, and all the people fall backward to the Romans. He saw all that. And then he was there at the house of uh, Annas and Caiaphas and, and, and denied Jesus three times. And then he, then he sees Jesus in the resurrection. And then he, he's even fed at the Sea of Galilee afterwards. So he, here's a guy that had an experience like nobody. Nobody had an experience like Peter. But then in the book of Galatians, He's compromised. After all, he saw he saw Peter change the world when he saw the vision at the house of Cornelius and the Holy Spirit given to the Gentiles. I mean, like, unbelievable stuff happened to Peter. And yet, in Galatians, he goes back to the law, and, and, and Paul has to rebuke him. And you're going, wow, if Peter can fall backwards, anybody can. Right. Anybody well, can. I, I, so, wouldn't, so, I, I wouldn't call Peter a failure. You see his failings, which is an open book for everybody to read. And most of us are much like Peter. We're full of bravado. Uh, Peter was also known as a guy who would curse a lot and stuff like that. It was He was a fisherman. You know, I, I find it very interesting. And let's just, like, talk about these apostles that Jesus picks. Quite the bunch. And fishermen is something you probably are aware of fishermen. They all have their stories that they like to tell, and they all know when the other one is you know, telling a fable. It's not exactly true. Uh, they're also, uh, in many ways, you know, Jesus didn't pick 12 highly educated guys that went to some sort of university. He, he picked fishermen. I mean, have you ever been around guys that like to fish? I mean, that's all that they can, they can think about. Uh, and, and, you know, you got a mouth like a sailor. I mean, these guys are sailors. So it's very interesting that Jesus picks this lot, including the tax collector and, and a, a few other guys with different backgrounds. But Peter, he really is a lot closer to who we are as people. And I, I think that that, you know, when you look at his life, it's an open book in the Scripture. Uh, we like, we'd like to think that we wouldn't do the same thing, but uh, I have a s- suspicion that if we were in his shoes, we probably would do the same sort of thing. Well, we do the same thing, and I and I withdraw what I said about failure. He had failings, that's for sure, and we and we do too, and we will. Uh, his biggest failing was was he, in fact that scripture said, uh, if anybody preaches another gospel in Galatians, let him be accursed, because Peter was preaching a different gospel where you not only have to. Uh, live by grace, but you need to add a little law in there, too. And I'm seeing this everywhere. I'm just seeing people, well, you know, it's not enough just to trust in God for your redemption. You you really have to live the law, too. Uh, you have to keep the law. And I'm seeing this where people are trying to have some kind of addition to grace. It's a free gift. It's a mm. gift from God. You cannot add to it. You just have to continue to receive from it. And yet people are trying to add uh, uh, the law to grace mm. and and, uh, and Paul and P- Paul saying you know if this isn't the gospel Peter and you're you should know better than any we're not just sinners from the Gentiles we're sinners from the Jews we should know better than anybody that know that righteousness not, cannot come from keeping the law it has to come by faith through grace continually and and and, and yet uh, when people don't. Uh, deal with their failures through uh, repentance and and uh, the application of the blood this is why communion the other the other uh a sacrament is so critical do this often why because we stray from the gospel That's we right. stray away from, and and we need to we need the atonement daily we need, we need it daily uh people mistake foot washing for a literal thing to do to people's uh, uh, on, I've seen this, you know, where they have these foot washing services. But the foot washing is the washing of regeneration, which is the blood of Jesus, a renewing by the Holy Ghost. This is all by faith. It, it's you cannot fix yourself by uh, even going to church more often. It, it's all about 
your faith with Jesus himself and, and learning how to receive the atonement. That's what, the Catholics made a, a terrible mistake, which brought about the Reformation, where they thought they could sell indulgence. Oh, yeah, that, 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 that was horrible. Yep. I agree, and, and, and that that reaction in in some of these guys in the you know Luther and, and these other people that led the Reformation were protesting. They were called Protestants because they were protesting the selling of indulgences. We tend to do that, thinking, well, we can just do whatever we please since we're saved by grace. No, that's not the point. Right. Well, the point you, is that, you, you had the Catholic Church in that time of the Reformation that was abusing uh, the body of Christ. We'll just say it like that. And then you had the reformers who, in many cases, went way too far. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and, and so therefore you get, here's the thing about the church, or if, if you want to use the term denomination, if you're going to look for the perfect church, the perfect denomination, the perfect place, the perfect you, you're never going to find it because we're all imperfect. So stop doing that. And then, you know, it's also a good idea not to be so judgmental of others. Use your judgment, but don't be judgmental, because it's not our position to judge. It says so in the Bible, right? Well, you know what? Um, that's, a, that's, that's an interesting discussion in, in and of itself, because uh, when Paul uh, was dealing with the Corinthians, there was a guy sleeping with his father's wife, and Paul says, get this guy out of there. Isn't there anybody there that can judge righteous judgment? This guy's going to mess everybody up, so you got to get him, you got to throw him out. And here, so here's Paul making a judgment about a condition going on in the church that's a, that to Paul is intolerable. Mm-hmm. But I think, I think, well, that, that's a we... that that's a different set, almost a different set of circumstances, and it's a situational thing as well. And then you have the people who, uh, at that time, Paul's an apostle; he represents Christ on earth. So there is leadership within the church, and everybody has a function. And he talks about the different body parts and how you know what good is it just being a foot, or what good is it if you're only an eye. All the body of uh, all your body parts, the the whole body of Christ is equally important. And you know, what something causes you to sin, you have to cut it off. So, for that man's own good, he should be expelled from the community. But nowhere did Paul say that he can't repent and return. Yeah, and 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 I I think the other side of the of the coin is when the woman's caught in adultery and Jesus uh, bends down and writes in the dirt. Uh, and he's probably writing the names of the mistresses of the Sanhedrin. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's good, uh, quite possible. Yeah. But but he says, now go. I, I don't condemn you. He judged her. He judged what she was doing is wrong. But he didn't condemn her. That's right. So so there's judgment and discernment, but there is no condemnation. Uh, so he didn't condemn her, saying, "Okay, get 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 out of Israel." Right. Exactly. Uh, yes. So it, it, when when it says. Con- it, it is, the word there, antikrino, I believe, is the Greek word. Is like condemn not, lest you be condemned. So it's not, there's a difference between condemnation and judgment, and I think uh, uh, that's not really been clearly explained. Uh, Jesus didn't condemn anybody because he came to re- he came to save us because we are condemned. We are condemned because the law condemns us. Uh, that that's what the law was supposed to do. It was supposed to show us that we're in a condition that there's no hope for. You know, you, you're not going to be able to live under the judgment of the law. The law condemns. That's what it says in mm-hmm. Romans. Uh, um, yeah, I, I there's, mean, when, when... there's therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, uh, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit, because Jesus came, to, and that's why the book, The Tree, The Unforgettable Tree, so powerful, because you see that uh, that God has, has taken away the fig tree where he was hung mm-hmm. uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a part of vellum, which was a board, and hoisted up there and connected to the tree. The tree was a representation of the law. The fig tree is, is a representation in, in the garden, is a representation of the law. And so God, in saying, look, I'm condemning this tree, which is a representation of the law, because I'm going to put the law aside, because the law will condemn you. Nobody can stand under the harshness of the law, and I'm going to remove that. So I'm going to give you a new covenant. I'm going to give you a whole new deal. That's why I came. 
is to is to do away with a law that condemns you and helps uh, explain the horrible, hopeless condition you're in as opposed to my holiness. And I'm going to give you a whole nother way, a whole new covenant, not like the one I gave your fathers on Sinai, uh, but but a whole new covenant. And I'm going to get away. I'm going to make the law obsolete. That's what he did. It says it in the book of Hebrews. So we have a new covenant, you know, that that is so forgiving, so full of mercy. I think it's interesting, you know, when you look at the book of Revelation, what do you see there? You see the Ark of the Covenant in the temple of God in mm-hmm. the heavens. And and I talk to the Seventh-day Adventists about this. They say, yeah, but you open that Ark up, and what do you find in there? You find the law. We have to keep the law. Away. Yeah, but you forget to notice that on top of that, Ark of the Covenant is the mercy seat. The mercy uh, triumphs over judgment. The mercy triumphs over the law. That's the whole message of why it's kept in the heavens. Mm. It's not about to say, well, you know, well, well, you have to still keep the law because it's inside the Ark of the Covenant. I said, yeah, but you missed the whole point of it being there, and that is the mercy of God, which we talked about at the beginning of this broadcast. It's God's mercy to come here and to remove the law from us so that we have a hope and forgiveness of sins and eternal life back with God from this condition that we find ourselves in uh, as human beings living in a crazy world, mm-hmm. you know, that's full of full of uh, confusion and and, uh, and chaos. Uh, it's It's impossible. It's, you know, angels don't like to come into this world because of that. They don't want to get polluted. So they make short sorties in here to give us little bits of, of glory because they can't take it. They don't like being here. Well, and that, when you read about the angels, that's what they do. They just make quick trips here, and then they're out of here. Let, let's so think about—let's uh, go over a couple of thoughts I have, and we'll get to uh, Chapter 10, False Flags in the Unforgettable Tree. Some observations that I've made. Uh, for instance— at the crucifixion, you have the thief on the cross who is one of the first people that Jesus uh, talks about going into heaven. It's a deathbed confession, which are few and far between in the Bible. And then you have one of his own, his apostle, Judas, who obviously goes to hell. As far as I know, I mean, I, I would only assume. I, I don't know, uh, you know, how it worked out for Judas. But, you know, we like to think that we'd be that thief on the cross that would confess him to be the the son of God and and ask to be in paradise. We'd like to think that we wouldn't be the uh, apostle that betrayed him like Judas. We like to think those things, but be wary because we can fall into the same traps very easily. Um, The thing about Judas, the thing about uh, what he did, I think in many ways, because they were looking for a different Messiah in that time period, Somebody that somebody that would restore the kingdom of Israel in its former glory, like under David, and uh, do away with the Romans. And so I think the betrayal and what Judas does, he's trying to force Jesus's hand, and in a way trying to force the next step. And, and I think that he miscalculated, obviously. And we see that today. There is a, I guess, part of the Christian world who wants to force the return of Jesus by building the, I guess it would be the the fourth temple, really, or they say the third temple, but I don't know how many times it was built before. One, two, all right, so maybe the third temple. So, So in other words, in order for the return of Jesus, the temple has to be rebuilt on the Temple Mount, and the priesthood of the ancient Jewish people has to be reestablished. Can you comment on that, and does that have anything to do with the, the chapter on false flags in the unforgettable tree? Oh, my gosh. See, I always I, do that I, to you, don't I? <laughs> well, I made a movie about uh, the lost temple of the Jews. Uh, I have a film on this whole subject at Ken Klein. Uh, what's, what's the name of it? KenKleinProductions.net <laughs> is your website. <laughs> this week, I, this week I got it right. Yeah. I, I do. I made a movie about this, uh, uh, this whole issue of the temple, and uh, you know this. This is a fascinating uh, issue you've raised here because the Jews, of course, there have been five attempts at the rebuilding of the temple. By the way, see, I, um, I knew I, I knew it was more than three. I, 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 I for some reason, I'm thinking now it's 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 more than just three. But now we're calling it the third temple. Well, and people think, well, uh, you know. This next temple will be the the temple in Ezekiel forty through forty four, 
or they'll think, uh, no, it's uh, mentioned in Revelation 11, measure the, the John has got this measuring uh, rod, and measure the temple, the altar, but don't measure the outer court. It's been given over to the Gentiles to be trampled down. And so some people think, well, that that's dealing with the third temple, you know, uh, that's what they call it, the third temple. But but uh, none of that's none of that's right, uh, even though it's in the scriptures, and there's an explanation for all that. Uh, the, the, the third temple, uh, which is not only expected by the Jews, and I've in, interviewed rabbis, uh, Rabbi Richmond of the Temple Mount, uh, uh, um, what's it called, the Temple Mount, not the Temple Mount of Faith, I can't remember. The Dome of the Rock? Organ. Well, the, oh, no, the Wailing uh, Wall. I mean, what? what? Well, the Temple uh, Do, uh, Rabbi Richmond uh, is working real hard to build all the musical instruments and oh. and, and developing the Kohanim and uh, re remaking all of the artifacts for the temple. They've done. They've all done this. this is, they've got a museum or a place there in, in the Jewish quarter of the old city, which I've been to many times. And and, and it, to me, it's a, it's silly. Uh, they, they're not they're not built according to scripture. But these people are pushing hard to have the temple rebuilt there. Well, I would say, you know, if they build it, Jesus won't come. The Messiah will not come to that temple, and I'll tell you why. And it's a simple thing that is missed by most theologians, uh, which are, you know, uh, uh, religious academians, which the, the fishermen certainly were not. And that's why Jesus picked them, because they weren't polluted by mind circuitries that were dogmatized by tradition. Uh, but uh, the, in, in the 43rd chapter of the book of Ezekiel, uh, God is giving to Ezekiel these amazing instructions for the measurement of this temple. The temple that God is uh, prescribing for them or, or wanting to have built was the temple that was to follow the destruction of Solomon's temple by the Babylonians. He's getting these instructions while he's in Babylon. And they're amazing. Four chapters of measurements of this, of how God wants to have this new temple built. And but then He goes on to say to uh, Ezekiel, "Now give them, give them these instructions if they repent." And you go, "Well, they've been there seventy years. Don't you think that their hearts are kind of humbled?" But when when uh, Ezekiel c- contemplates uh, what God's saying to offer to these people. The repentance that God is talking about concerning what the Jews need to repent of is what their evil kings like Ahab uh, and Ahaz and all these wicked kings did when they embraced uh, the moon god or or the god of of the Philistines, the god of the Gentiles. And the moon god today, of course, is Islam. In other words, they were incorporated into their temple worship, the religions of the pagans, and that's why God said uh, initially to the northern tribes, uh, the Assyrians to destroy the ten tribes, and then eventually the sickness got down into Jerusalem, and then the God sent the Babylonians to say, "Hey, I not only despise what you're doing, I'm going to I'm going to destroy my temple through the Babylonians, who I am raising up as my righteousness to deal with you." And so uh, the. The the Lord is saying, I I want all of these evil kings that have done that, I want their tombs dug up and put on the mountain of disgrace, which was the southern half of the Mount of Olives. That was the mountain of disgrace. And and I don't want them even close to where my uh, new temple will be. And so don't give them these plans unless they repent of that. Dig up these evil kings and bury them somewhere else. Get them out of my sight. And then, then he goes on to say, this is the law of the house. Now, think about this. This is the law of the house. Uh, Do you think, now I know you, this is rhetorical, so forgive me for, I don't mean to put you on the spot with this, but consider what I'm saying. Does God have to make a deal with Satan to build his temple? Do, do Do you think that God would have a temple be built next to the Dome of the Rock, which inside says God has no son? Wouldn't that be akin to the same kind of embracing of the moon god, since Islam is the moon god, that goes all the way back to the Egyptian Empire. I can talk about that. I've made movies on that myself. So, so like I say, if, if the Jews force that up there, which the Christians' world will be very excited about, because, oh, that's a fulfillment of prophecy. This is the third temple. Not only will he not come, 
it'll be a disgrace and an abomination of desolation for that temple to be built there because it's a compromise that Sorry, my father would not let his Messiah come to that temple through the Eastern Gate, which is also a joke. It's all in my film, uh, but uh, we are so excited about a third temple because it's a fulfillment of prophecy. And I'm going, no, it's not. This has nothing to do with prophecy. It has nothing to do with Ezekiel's temple, and it doesn't have anything to do with the temple that's talked about in Revelation 11. Totally different thing. And yet, here we are we're having this patchwork theology that doesn't help anybody, and yet this is a powerful force going on in Jerusalem today. And and I, I, I did the film on it. Well, that's Jerusalem exciting. Is that is exciting stuff. We're running out of time, Ken. So if you want to get The Unforgettable Tree, the other books as, long, as well as the movie— and the university, which you can sign up for, subscribe to, and uh, Ken will give us a little bit of insight on, on that. What's going on with the university before we wrap it up, and then I'll give everybody the website. Well, I, I do uh, weekly teachings. They're only 10 minutes, but they're powerful stuff. It's like, you know, a concentration of stuff that will make you— uh, it's, like, uh, it's like the food that— uh, Elijah ate when he had to go for 40 days. It sustained him. This is powerful stuff. And just all, go, all you have to do is go to Ken Klein uh, Productions. Productions. net. <laughs> <laughs> forget my website. And, and, and it's free. It, but, but the reason you, you have to sign up is because every time I do a posting with YouTube, they will let you know when it's there. So That's awesome. Uh, it's just a reminder. Uh, it's free. It's, it's for God's people. And Thanks for the chance to share that. Well, Appreciate thank you very much, Ken. Next week, we'll talk a little bit more about your visitation with these angels. I find that really interesting. We'll talk more from the Unforgettable Tree. We'll also talk about the temple and whatever else you want to bring up next week. And also, let's pay attention to what's going on in the news uh, over this next week to see how it pertains into biblical prophecy.